Welcome, E4 Family Church. It's Communion Sunday. Join us in just a few minutes and taking communion together as a family. We're continuing with our series, A Disciple's Journey. Follow me. If you have missed any part of this series, I invite you to look at our YouTube channel at our on-demand section or visit our website. We are taking a deep dive into the book of Mark in our Bible studies. I invite you to join us either in person at 3 p.m. on Saturdays at church or online at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings through Zoom. Don't miss this opportunity as we come together to learn more about our Savior, ask the questions, and grow in our knowledge and understanding together. E4 Kids, your worship service starts right now at e4familychurch.com. We're beginning a new series and we will be learning all about confidence. Parents, we have included a parent guide that will assist you with today's message. I invite you to worship the Lord through your giving at e4familychurch.com. We are back in person. Join us at 4 p.m. on Saturdays at our Arlington location. It is time to worship. It's time to pray. Join me in praying. God, we are so grateful and thankful for who you are. God, thank you for your word today. God, I pray you would pour into us, Lord God, that as the sower sows the seed, we would be good soil and we would receive the word today. God, I just pray for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, that you would bring peace and comfort to them. God, I pray for those who may be downcasted, God, that the joy of the Lord would be their strength. God, I pray that those who may need encouragement would be encouraged today through your word. Lord, I thank you for speaking to each one of us today concerning what concerns us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.
your name it is Nothing can stand against What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus Welcome back. I hope that you've had an opportunity to get your communion elements, your crackers, toast, bread, juice, water, whatever you have. I hope you've had the opportunity to gather your family, your friends, whoever is in the home with you so that we can prepare our hearts for communion. Let's go to the scripture. First Corinthians 11, 27 says, so then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in a way that is unworthy of him will be guilty of profaning and sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. But a person must prayerfully examine himself and his relationship to Christ. And only when he has done so, should he eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without solemn reverence and heartfelt gratitude for the sacrifice of Christ, eats and drinks a judgment on himself if he does not recognize the body of Christ. So first, while we prepare our hearts, one way to prepare our heart is to examine our hearts. Is there unforgiveness in your heart? What is it? What is going on? Now is an opportunity to search your heart. Ask the Lord to search your heart, to let you know if there's anything there that is hindering your relationship with, between you and him. And after you have examined your heart, maybe you heard something. Maybe you heard you have unforgiveness. Maybe you heard something else. Whatever it is, the second step is to repent of it and repent. Repent simply means to turn away from, turn back to the Father, right? And so I want you to do that. I want you to take whatever that is. If it's unforgiveness, repent to the Lord, ask for forgiveness and turn back to the Father. And then ask for forgiveness, receive forgiveness, forgive others. This is an opportunity where if someone has sinned against you to release them, forgive them, just as your father has forgiven you in heaven. Forgive yourself. Maybe you've done something and God is already forgiving you and you still are harboring that thing in your heart. Let it go. God says he has separated our sins as far as the east is from the west. Receive his Freedom, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So let that go right now. And join me in praying before we take our communion. God, thank you for this opportunity to take this supper with you, Father. God, I just thank you for my brothers and sisters. We just give over all those things concerning us to you, God. We give it over to you. Anything that's in our heart that's not pleasing to you, God, bring it to our knowledge right now so that we can take communion together. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the bread. And let's take the juice. We believe that God is the good and eternal creator of all things, seen and unseen, and that he has spoken authoritatively to us through his written word. We believe that every single human being is made by God and for God, and therefore is important to God, no exceptions. We also believe that every human being is sinful and broken, that even the best of us have deep-rooted evil in our hearts that comes out in all sorts of ugly ways in our actions, in our words, in our attitudes, no exceptions there either. We also believe that God was unwilling to let our sins have the final say over our eternity. And so he became a man in the person of Jesus Christ to save us and to open the eyes of our darkened hearts. We believe that Jesus didn't just perform miracles 
and love people and live a sinless life. And he didn't even just die on the cross, but actually three days later, he literally and physically rose from the dead to prove his power over sin and death and hell and to offer to every single person in this room eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. That's what we believe. We believe that through Jesus, yes, we get heaven later. But right now, we get power and purpose and comfort and guidance and a family of faith to lean on for the rest of our life, starting right now. You cannot earn the grace of God by your good works and you cannot lose it because of your bad ones. Otherwise, it would not be grace. No one is so good they don't need grace. No one is so bad they can't have it. But even in this very moment, the arms of Jesus Christ, the resurrected King, are open to you. For anyone who would reach up to him and stand on his gospel. That's what we believe. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the family. Since I was a child, I've always made plans. I've been a planner. I would especially make plans as we would get closer to Saturday because, listen, if you grew up in the 80s, you already know where I'm going. Saturday was cartoon day and you had to have all your chores done, everything so that you could get up in peace and watch your cartoons. Man, few things compared to watching Saturday morning cartoons with a bowl of cereal on a cold day in the Midwest. It was amazing. That was my plan. But then it would be those days where I would wake up business as usual and I would hear things and my parents were making plans and, and I would walk in and their plans were completely different than my plans. And because I was a child, I had to submit to their plan. I would discover that, man, what they were planning was far greater than what I had in mind. I was just going to sit down with a bowl of cereal, watch a couple of cartoons, but their plans usually involved us getting in a car, going someplace extraordinary. You see, I had to learn then to trust. You know what? My parents got this, that I might have my own plans, but it's better to yield to the plans of my parents because it usually involves someplace exciting, that they had been up days, weeks, months planning this. And I get it now as a dad. Jackie and I love to make plans for our kids. It's the joy and privilege. I mean, listen, holidays, birthdays are far greater today as an adult than they ever were as a child because now I get to be on the side of planning. But friends, the truth is this. Since the beginning of time, God has big plans for us. And those plans haven't deviated. But sadly, since the beginning of time, God creates the first man, the first woman, the first marriage, the first couple, and they immediately stiff arm God's plan in favor of their own. And as a result, man, they missed out on God's best. And so the invitation we have is we read through Mark chapter 10 on this discipleship journey is we get the opportunity to say yes to God's big plans for us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your desire. I thank you for your plan. And Father, where we have at times been just like Adam, just like Eve, and we have deviated from your plans. Father, today I pray by faith that we would repent of that and we would run towards your plan, that we would say yes to your will and we would do the very thing that Jesus did. He said, not my will, but thy will be done. And so Father, we pray that over us today as we receive your word, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we continue on this journey, one of the big things that Jesus is confronted with is this attack on marriage. You see, there were two big schools of thought uh, in the days of Jesus. Uh, one school of thought in Jewish tradition was under uh, a guy named Hillel. And Hillel had kind of more of a liberal approach on in terms of of his interpretation of the Torah. And he would be what we would call somebody that leans left. And then there was a, a another 
famous rabbi that lived uh, not quite a contemporary. He was towards the end of Hillel's uh, reign over the, the leading the, the priesthood and, and the interpretation of the Torah. And his name was Shemai. And Shemai was a little more strict, kind of black and white. And he would be one that leaned more right. And they brought this argument to Jesus. And they wanted to know that, hey, what are your views? Do you lean left? Do you lean right? And we're going to pick up in Mark chapter 10 and get Jesus's response. It says, then he arose from there and he came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan and a multitude gathered to him again. And as he was accustomed, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came and they asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And they were testing him. And again, what was the test? Do you lean left? Do you, are you part of the school of Hillel or do you lean right? Are you part of the school of Shammai? Where are you? And he answered and he said to them, what did Moses command you? And this is very important language that we have to grab a hold of. And they said, well, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. Like literally for any reason, if she didn't want to be, if he didn't want to be bothered with her, he could go down to the, to the priest and say, hey, you know what? I, I, she burnt the toast, right? What, whatever reason, Moses permitted this. And Jesus answered and he said to them, mm, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. And in actuality, that was not a proper interpretation, because when you read through Deuteronomy, Moses never permitted, nor did he command them to divorce. And Jesus does something very important. But verse six, he says, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And he goes on in verse eight, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And this is a big thing because what they were trying to do was trap Jesus with the law. And so Jesus responds by saying, what did Moses command you? You see, there is no command to divorce. And what he was saying was, God didn't permit this. God didn't want this. God didn't create this. Y'all did. And, and it was something that was introduced because your hearts were hard. And notice, there are no women in this discussion. It's a group of men that are selfish and they want what they want. And sadly, what they were doing is they were breaking and destroying marriages for any reason under the sun. It was awful. In fact, when you read through the book of Malachi, this is one of the things that Jesus is so upset by, that they are leaving these women destitute, and they were basically treating them less than a second-class citizen. And what God does is so powerful, is he elevates the status of marriage and says it's not something that Moses created. It's not something that Moses designed. It's something that I created and something that I designed. And this business of divorcing your wife from anything is not from me. Moses permitted this because your hearts were hard and he was making some type of an allowance because you were doing it anyway. But if you ask me, I don't lean left and I don't lean right. I'm for the kingdom of God. Verse 10, in the house, his disciples asked him again about the same matter. And so he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery as well. And when you read some of the parallel passages uh, in the other gospels, you know, they respond like, well, then who should get married? And Jesus was like, listen, marriage is something that I created. And there are some that are called to be single. Clearly, we see that in the life of Jesus when he walked this earth. He was not married. Now, we do know, as you keep reading through the Gospels, he's looking forward to a wonderful wedding. But then there's the Apostle Paul. And Paul says, listen, I, I wish that you would be like I am, that you would remain single. And so there are many that are called to be single. But there are others who are called to be married. And what God is saying, if you're going to teach on marriage, do so from my perspective, because God has big plans for marriage, and it is all about the two becoming one. Now, if you find yourself in a situation where you've gone through a divorce, listen, 
Jesus understands. In fact, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is so extraordinary. It's when Jesus encounters a woman that was divorced, not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. And the man she was living with, she was shacking. And Jesus goes to this woman. In fact, the Bible says he had to go to Samaria for the sole goal and purpose of reaching to that woman. And he says, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for a cup of water and I would give you living water. And in the course of this conversation, she discovers she's talking to the Messiah. And the apostles are amazed. They're like, how is he talking to her? Because she's wrong ethnicity. She's a woman living in sin. Like, what are you doing? And yet Jesus spoke with her. And in response, he introduces who he is. And salvation comes not just to that woman, but to all of the people of Samaria. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're like, man, I've been through a divorce, then go to God. Talk to him. Repent and listen, God is faithful to forgive. And who knows, he might decide to use you in the same way that he used that woman at the well to reach back to your whole family so that they too can be saved. Then Jesus goes on and he lets us know his plans for children. Now, this is a big deal because I don't care what generation you grew up in, but especially in mine and even in my parents' generation, children were often told, listen, you are to be seen and not heard. Look, that doesn't work in my house. We've got five children. You're not only going to see my children, you will hear them. And in fact, we encourage it. And so does God. Mark chapter 10, verse 13. Then he brought little children. They brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Get them kids out of here. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased. And he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. This is extraordinary. What he is saying is this. Listen, not that children are innocent. Because if you've got kids, you already know, you don't have to teach a child mine that we are born naturally selfish. But what children do possess is they possess a faith on the inside of them. They believe what their parents teach them. And as we grow older, sadly, we grow out of that and we become a little paranoid, suspicious even. Why are you being kind to me? Like, what would you put in this? But with children, listen, you put some candy out there and before you can even say you, you can have it. You put it in front of them, it's it's gone. They expect that you're going to do that kind of thing for them. And they just have trust. And Jesus saying the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who humble themselves like a child. Surely I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms and he laid his hands on them. And he blessed them. It's an extraordinary gift. It's so wonderful. The disciples are like, hey, we're having some adult conversation here. Shoo, shoo. And Jesus says, no, we're having an appropriate conversation here. Bring them to me. There is no junior Holy Spirit. Bring them. Don't stop them. Don't prevent them. Let them come to me because the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. The third thing we discover is God's plan for the seeker, for those who are lost but are looking for the kingdom of God. Uh, This is a big story, and we have to really unpack it together. But beginning in verse 17, it says, Now as he was going out on the road, one came running. This is important. This person's looking. He's seeking. He's running. And he knelt before him. And he asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? This is a big question. This is not something you just ask someone randomly. He is coming because he recognizes and has heard about the miracles that Jesus has done. And he knows that, hey, if if anybody knows the way to heaven, the way to eternal life, the way to the kingdom of God, it's this guy. And so Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one. And that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. 
honor your father and your mother. This is quite a list, but I love the response of this man. And he answered and he said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And then Jesus looking at him, he loved him. And he said to him, one thing you lack. That's big. You want to know how to get to the kingdom of heaven? You only lack one thing. Like imagine being told that by God. You only lack one thing. You're almost there. You're almost there. Go your way. Sell whatever you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. What an invitation. You want eternal life? You're asking the right question. Here's the answer. But he was sad at this word and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And then Jesus looked around. And he said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his word. But Jesus answered again and he said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished at the saying and saying among themselves, who then can be saved? And for them, you got to put it in context. You're like, who? Because this guy, listen to the list. He did it all. And, and Jesus didn't say, well, no, you didn't. He says, listen, you lack one thing. Great. You've done it all. But you lack one thing. But Jesus looked at them and he said, with men, it is impossible. That the one thing that he lacks, he can't do on his own. This is an impossibility. And notice he didn't say for rich men, it's impossible. He says, but with men, for all men, for with people, it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Salvation is only possible through God. Then Peter began to say to him, well, see, we have left all and we followed you. And so Jesus answered and he said, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or house or brothers or sister or father or mother or wife or children or land for my sake in the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands but with persecutions. And in the age to come, the very thing he was asking for, eternal life. And then Jesus concludes with this, but many who are first will be last and the last shall be first. We have to unpack this here because this is a big thing, but I want you to understand what Jesus is saying from the beginning, that oftentimes we hear this story and we don't put it in the right context because when he began the conversation and he said, good teacher, Jesus responds and he says, why do you call me good? None is good, but one. And that is God. And friends, what he wasn't saying was, I'm not good. What he is saying is, we're about to have a tough conversation here. And you've come to me rightly so. And notice he bowed to Jesus and Jesus didn't say, get up, don't, don't, don't bow to me. He's, he's good with all of this. Why? Because he's wanting the young man to know and everyone else present. I am not speaking just as an angel of the Lord, but I'm speaking as the Lord. You are coming to me and I need you to acknowledge that what I'm about to tell you is straight from heaven, that this is why I'm here. I am God wrapped in flesh. And as you ask the question for eternal life, you need to know these words aren't just from a prophet. These words aren't just from a great teacher. These words aren't just from a great scholar, but they're from God alone. They're none good but me. And that's why he says, you know, the commandments and his response, he says, I have done it all. And then Jesus, th this list that he gives, it it's not the full list. He leaves off one really important question. 
And he answered and he said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. And then Jesus looked at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack. And the very thing that he was lacking was the first commandment. Go sell whatever you have so you can tally it up and know what your net worth really is. And then give that stuff to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Come and take up the cross and follow me. He was inviting this young man to be one of his disciples. So extraordinary. But the young man couldn't do it. And the reason why was because Jesus acknowledged real quick and wanted him to acknowledge. You call me Lord, but what's your real Lord? What's your real Lord? Verse 22 tells us, he went away sad at this word and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And then Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and he said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches. Friends, that word trust is the same word of believe. Are you a believer in Christ? Well, friends, this man was a believer in his riches. He trusted in his riches. And the very first commandment, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Listen, there's only one God. You need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And this man couldn't do it. He instead looked at his wealth and his riches, and he wanted to have one arm around this world and the other arm around his riches. And the Lord said, you can't worship me and mammon. You can't do both make a choice. And sadly, the man did. He walked away sad knowing that I can't pay the price for eternal life because the price is for me to give up this life and instead to choose the life that God has for me. It's a big deal. Then Jesus goes on because he not only is sharing his heart for the seeker, but chapter four is extraordinary because he also lets us know his plan for the loss. 1032. Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was going before them and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the 12 aside again and he began to tell them things that would happen to him. Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be betrayed by the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. and they will mock him and they will scourge him and they will spit on him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they came to him saying, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Jesus has told him he's about to die. And they cut Jesus off and they got their own plan. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Did you not just hear my plan? And they said to him, grant us that we may sit one at your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you ask. Like you're talking crazy right now. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? and be baptized with the baptism that I'm gonna be baptized with? And they said to him, we are able. And by this, he wasn't talking about John's baptism in the water or baptism with the Holy Spirit. He was talking about the baptism of death to be martyred. And so Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism that I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left, it's not mine to give but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the 10 heard it, they began greatly to be displeased with James and John. (coughs) They're like, what? First off, they're like, why didn't we think it is? But Jesus called to them to himself and he said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first, number one, shall be slave of all. 
For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Friends, that's God's plan. The whole goal of why Jesus left heaven and he came to earth was so that he could save the lost. And in the midst of this, the disciples still confused. When you come into your glory, can I sit on your left and on your right? And Jesus is like, no, you, you will drink from the cup that I'm going to drink from and, and be martyred. But, but listen to why I came. Listen to your hearts. You are so focused on you and what you're going to come into instead of realizing that I came to save that which was lost. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Friends, what this tells us, that word ransom, that there's a, there's a price that we all have to pay because the penalty is deep. You see, hell was not created for people. It was actually created for a rebellious group that got kicked out of heaven for Satan and his demons. There's a day coming where they will be thrown into the fire and they know it. This is why when Jesus is performing miracles and they see him and they say, have you come to torment us for our time? And God's plan from the beginning was for mankind to live with him. But because Adam and Eve and our ancestors thereafter in our own very nature, we keep stiff arming God's plan. And in doing so, friend, listen, to not do God's plan, to really the, the word is sin. Choosing to do your will rather than his will is sinning against God. Choosing to do your truth and your thing instead of God's truth and his thing is to stiff arm the one who created you and I for a purpose. And the reason why God came was so that he could save us so that we can live out that purpose, but also pay the ransom because the, the penalty of one sin is death an eternal separation from God. And that's something that God said, listen, I can't bear it. I want you to be with me. And so Jesus in agreement with the will of the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit came in flesh so that he can pay the ransom for your life and mine. And as he continues this journey and the disciples are still not able to get it, finally Jesus performs a miracle that I believe is, is perfect in the timing of it. He's talking to them, trying to get them to have eyes to see and ears to hear why he came. And then he reveals his plan for those who call out to him. Those that find themselves so far from him, unable to get to him. Mark 10, 46 says, now he came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road and he was begging. That was his job. It's the only work he could find. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then many warned him to be quiet. Shh, shh, shh. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. I love this. This is so powerful. In our own lives, we, we can find ourselves so distant from God and those around us telling us, Shh, be quiet. You're too loud. We don't want to hear all of that. Shut up. In verse 49. And so Jesus still stood still. This is so good. And he commanded him to be called. And then they called the blind man saying to him, look, be of good cheer. Rise. He's calling you. This is so good. The man begins by calling out to Jesus. And then Jesus responds by calling out to him. And throwing aside his garment. I mean, imagine this man's blind and he hears. But, but even though he can't see, man, in the spirit, he gets it. He knows who Jesus is, even calling him son of David. Recognizing the prophetic word about the one that's going to sit on the throne. That's him. And he calls out. And though he can't see in the natural he can see in the spiritual. And he knows, listen, you can't keep me quiet. He calls out, son of David, have mercy on me. 
And Jesus replies. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and he came to Jesus. And so Jesus answered and he said to him, what do you want me to do for you? I love this. And this is a conversation that Jesus speaks out loud. But we can tell from this passage that the man responds from his heart because it doesn't even give us the words that the man utters. But verse 52 gives us the response to his prayer. And then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus on the road. This is so powerful. This whole deal tells us about God's plan. That listen, God loves the seeker who comes to see him, who's looking for him. But when we find ourselves so distant from him, I want to encourage you right where you are is to call out and you will discover God's plan for those who reach out to him. The prayer he prays, it's not a prayer, Lord, make me wealthy, Lord, make me rich, Lord. He's not asking any of those things. He is simply saying, have mercy on me. And friends, that's a prayer we need to pray because we need God to have mercy on us. Because so many times in our lives, when God offers his perfect plan for us, we act just like Adam and Eve and we stiff arm that plan. But friends, today on this journey, I want to encourage you to say yes to God's perfect plans for you. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message? Father, I pray today that my brothers and sisters will respond. We're asking you to have mercy on us as we've created our own truth, our own way of thinking. When Father, you've already established truth. You are the truth. You are the way. You are the life. And so, Father, today we come to you saying yes and amen to your plan. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, blessings, brothers and sisters. I love y'all. I am excited about this series. Listen, if you want to go deeper, come hang out with us. We do Bible study on Saturday at 3 p.m. Uh, in person in the DFW area. And if you're connecting with us online, you can hang out with us at 9 a.m. Central Time. And we do a Zoom Bible study as well. We're all about making disciples because ultimately that's what Jesus commanded us to do. God bless you. And I can't wait to connect with y'all.